So far we have described games using the normal form or matrix form. What that means is uh, we show in a matrix the uh, strategies, the choices that the players can make, maybe top and bottom for player one, and for player two, maybe left and right, and then for each combination of choices like top left, we show the payoffs for those two players. So top right maybe gets zero, zero, and maybe bottom left gets two, zero, and then bottom right would get maybe two, two. And that's a description of the game. We have the players, we have the actions that they have available, and we have the payoffs for every combination of actions. In such a game, we assume that player one and player two move simultaneously. Uh, in other words, when player one moves, he doesn't know what player two is doing, and when player two moves, she doesn't know what player one is doing. That uh, works a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, but many times we actually have to uh, describe the uh, temporal structure of the game. So, player two may move first, or maybe player one moves first. And then player two, if player one were to move first, would already know the choice that player one is making. And that would be a different kind of game. To describe a game like that, uh, we need the extensive form. In an extensive form game, we have uh, an opportunity to incorporate the temporal structure of the moves of the players. So in this game, for instance, the challenger gets to move first and choose whether to enter a market or stay out, and then the incumbent can acquiesce that entry or fight it. Um, and then, of course, if the challenger stays out, the incumbent doesn't even make a choice uh, in this kind of a game. So, um, in this game, these two players are not moving simultaneously, they are moving one after another. We still have to describe who the players are. We describe the actions and the temporal structure of the game using a game tree. Uh, in which there are some nodes that are terminal or end nodes, that's where the game ends, and other nodes are decision nodes where one or another player must make a choice. And then of course we have to say which player makes a choice at each decision node, uh, and finally we have to show payoffs or preferences for terminal nodes. So in the game that we just looked at, the players are the challenger and the incumbent, um, and the challenger can choose to um, enter the market or stay out, uh, if the challenger enters, the incumbent gets to choose to acquiesce or to fight that entry. Uh, the terminal nodes in this case are these, where the game ends, and we assign payoffs to those. For example, if the challenger um, enters the market and the incumbent fights, that's really bad for both of them and they both get a zero payoff. The decision nodes are this one where the challenger must make a choice and this one where the incumbent must make a choice. So in a game like that, notice that for every node we can associate a history of the game. For example, we got to this node by the challenger choosing in and the incumbent choosing to fight. And that's really the only way we can get to this node. For every node in an extensive form game we can associate such a unique history. So what's a Nash equilibrium in a game like this? First of all, we must uh, describe a strategy before we can say what a Nash equilibrium is. Uh, in principle, a Nash equilibrium is going to be the same thing as before, so it would be a combination of strategies such that neither player can do better by unilaterally deviating, assuming that the other player sticks to the same strategy uh, as they are following in the Nash equilibrium. So um, in this case, what would be a strategy? While well, the challenger can choose to enter the market or stay out, and the incumbent can choose to acquiesce the entry or fight it in case the challenger enters the market. So uh, how do we find a Nash equilibrium? One way to do it is really to start at the end of the game and this is called backward induction. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little more detail uh, soon. Um, but that would mean we would first ask what the incumbent would do if the challenger chooses to enter. And the incumbent would have a choice between acquiescing and getting one or fighting and getting zero, and therefore the incumbent will choose one, uh, acquiesce. Now, the challenger has a choice between entering the market knowing that the incumbent will acquiesce and therefore get two, or to stay out and therefore get one, and the challenger will choose to enter the market. So, in and acquiesce is a Nash equilibrium in this game because given what the other player is doing, each player is doing as well as they can be doing. Are there any other Nash equilibria? Well, um, let's see what happens if the incumbent chooses to fight. Um, you may say, well, why would the incumbent do that? Um, don't worry about that for a moment. Just suppose that the incumbent says, 
if you enter the market, I will fight the entry. The challenger, if he believes it, will, will then think this way. If I enter the market, I'll get zero because the incumbent will fight. If I stay out, I'll get one. So I'll stay out. Um, and in fact, out and fight is also an Nash equilibrium of this game. Um, given that the incumbent says that she will fight the uh, challenger's entry, the challenger is best off by staying out of the market. And given that the challenger stays out of the market, the incumbent uh, can threaten to fight without actually having to fight. That sort of threat is referred to as an incredible threat. It's not credible, it's incredible, because we know that if the challenger did enter the market, the incumbent actually would be better off acquiescing, and it would not be in her interest to fight the challenger's entry. But um, if the challenger believes that threat, then in fact he will stay out, and so that's an Nash equilibrium, but it's one that involves an incredible threat. So the two Nash equilibria in this game are in and acquiesce, and out and fight. Let's take a look at another game, uh, which is also a famous game uh, called the Ultimatum Game, in which uh, players 1 and 2 get to split $10. But the way they do it is uh, player 1 first gives an offer, and then player 2 gets to either accept it, in which case they follow the split player 1 offered, or 2 gets to reject it, in which case nobody gets anything at all. So you see, uh, if 2 chooses reject, then the payoffs are 0, 0 for both of them. One can choose to split uh, the $10 fairly, and in that case, if player 2 accepts, both get 5. Or in a greedy way, in which case, if player 2 accepts, player 1 gets 9, and player 2 gets only 1. So think about the Nash equilibria or equilibrium of this game. Well, first, let's think about what player 2 would do. If player 1 were to offer a greedy split, player 2 could reject it and then get 0, or accept it and get 1. The 1 is better than the 0. So player 2 would probably accept that. Even though it's not a great split, it's better than getting nothing at all. If player 1 were to offer a fair split, of course player 2 would accept that too. That, that makes uh, uh, a lot of sense because 5 would be better than the 0. Given that player 2 is going to accept no matter what, what should player 1 do? Well, of course, the fair split would give only 5 to player 1, but the greedy split would give 9. So player 1 is going to choose to split the $10 in a greedy way, and player 2 is going to accept because that's really the best that he can do. And that's a Nash equilibrium. Are there any other Nash equilibria in this game? Can you think of a way of player 2 two maybe making a threat uh, similar to the one in the previous game. Maybe a threat that could be an incredible threat, but uh, nevertheless could lead to another Nash equilibrium. Well, think about this. Suppose player two says, if you offer me the greedy split, I'm going to reject it. But if you offer me the fair split, I will accept it. Player one, knowing that, would say, well, if I believe that, for offering the greedy split, I get zero. For offering the fair split, I get five. I'm going to choose the fair split. So in fact, fair and accept, reject is also a Nash equilibrium of this game. It's one that, again, involves a so-called incredible threat because we know that if it really came to the greedy split, player two would be better off taking it, accepting it, than rejecting it. But if player one believes that threat, uh, then uh, she will in fact choose fair, and the outcome will be 5-5. Uh, five, five. Now, notice that the strategy for player 1 is simply fair, but for player 2 it's accept, reject. So we do need to say what player 2 would do even at a node that will not be reached in this equilibrium. Um, even at the nodes that will never happen because player 1 chooses fair, we need to say what player 2 would do. Why is that important? Well, player 1 um, would really not know what to do unless she has some idea of what player 2 would do, some belief about what player 2 would do if she were to choose greedy. So in our equilibrium, we need to describe what player 2 would do uh, at every decision node that player 2 has. So we have two Nash equilibria so far. 
could there be even more Nash equilibria? Well, think about this green equilibrium. In this one, player 2 threatens to reject a greedy offer and accept a fair offer, and therefore player 1 offers fair, a split of 5-5. Five, five. Would it be possible for player 2 to sort of do it the other way and threaten to reject a fair offer and accept a greedy offer? Well, you may say, why would you ever do that as player 2? We are not really talking about what would make sense in an intuitive way right now. We are talking about what would be the Nash equilibria of this game. So we are just asking, would it be a Nash equilibrium? We can then talk about whether it makes sense or not. But would it be a Nash equilibrium? Okay, um, well, let's think about it. So player 2 chooses reject, accept, player 1 chooses greedy. Could player 1 do better by choosing differently, given what player 2 is doing? Well, uh, for choosing fair, player 1 would get a 0. For choosing greedy, player 1 would get a 9. So, no, player 1 could not do better. She would choose greedy. What about player 2? Given that player 1 is choosing greedy, could he do better by choosing differently? Well, if he chose differently at this node, at this decision node, um, it actually wouldn't make any difference at all because player 1 is choosing greedy and this node is never reached uh, in this um, uh, pair of strategies. So player 2 couldn't do better by choosing except here because player 1 is choosing greedy. Uh, what about at this decision node? Uh, player 2 could choose reject and get 0 instead of 1. That's not better. So again, player 2 can't do better either given what player 1 is doing, which means this purple uh, pair of strategies is also a Nash equilibrium in this game which therefore has these three Nash equilibria. One of them, the first one, makes a lot more sense than the second or the third. The third seems to make no sense at all. The second involves an incredible threat. The first one seems to be the most sensible one. So is there any way to single out that first um, equilibrium? Um, and that's what subgame perfection does. The notion of subgame perfect equilibrium does for us. And the way we solve for a subgame perfect equilibrium is to ask what the last mover does first. So in this case, 2 is the last mover. Uh, so we ask, what, what would 2 do at those uh, almost terminal decision nodes? Um, and here, 2 would choose to accept, uh, as we already discussed earlier. And at this node, again, 2 would choose to accept. And given that 2 does that, we can go one level higher and ask, what would player 1 do, given those choices of player 2? And player 1 would choose greedy. And that's how we arrive at the subgame perfect equilibrium. Greedy, accept, accept. Notice again, we need to specify what player 2 does at every decision node uh, that he has. So uh, we think of a subgame perfect equilibrium as a more sensible equilibrium uh, in many ways. Um, and um, the other Nash equilibria are nevertheless Nash equilibria, but um, they don't seem to make as much sense often as the subgame perfect equilibrium. The way we find the subgame perfect equilibrium is called backward induction, and it means we start at the end of the game, we move one level up, and when we find the first decision node, we ask what would that player do, and then once we know for that level what that player does, we go one level up again and ask um, what the next player uh, would do. Um, and now we know here what player 2 would do already, so we can uh, talk about player 1's choice easily. So let's look at a somewhat more extended version of this game um, so that we can understand the notion of subgame perfect equilibrium better um, in a larger game. This is pretty much the same game as the one before. Uh, we are now splitting not $10 but 10 apples and we are doing it in two rounds. So what that means is player one still uh, gets to offer a fair split or a greedy split and if player two accepts then uh, the fair split leads to a 5-5 five, five split, and the greedy split leads to a 9-1 split. But if player 2 rejects, we play a second round of the same game. However, in the second round, you know, the first round took time, in the second round we don't have as many apples, because uh, unfortunately, by the time we get to the second round, uh, a couple of those apples have already gotten rotten. And uh, so now we only have 8 apples total, so in the second round, if player 1 offers a fair split and player 2 accepts, we only have 4 each. Um, of course, it's the same after this first round. Uh, in the second round, if player 1 offers a fair split and player 2 accepts, they each get 4 only. 
uh, and again if player two rejects the game is over and both get zero so in the second round a reject choice for player two leads to a zero um, if player one offers a greedy split in the second round then player one gets seven and player two gets one so after a greedy split in the second round it's going to be seven one first of all think about how many strategies each player has here how many decision nodes do they have well player one has this decision node and this one and this one that's three decision nodes and there are two choices at each decision node so one strategy for player one would be fair 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 another strategy would be greedy fair fair how many such strategies are there for player one think about that well two here two here two here that's two times two times two that's eight strategies for player one what about player two well player two has one two three four five six decision nodes so how many strategies does player two have think about that for a moment and this shows us uh, how complicated an extensive form game can get and um, therefore how important it is to be able to think through it and understand the strategic structure of the game without having to check every pair of strategies for player one and two against each other which would be virtually impossible um, without the help of uh, of course a computer so um, in this game how would these players act? Well, let's find the subgame perfect equilibrium using backward induction, uh, which we just learned about. First of all, these are the terminal nodes. These are all terminal nodes. And so uh, we start backward induction by going up from the terminal nodes and asking what the first player who must make a choice would do. So going up from here, player two here would have a choice between accepting and rejecting and getting four versus zero so player two would accept here player two again would accept a one instead of a zero then uh, again uh, notice we don't move up right away to this level but first we go through all the terminal nodes and move up one level and ask what the last player to make a choice would do player two again would accept four versus zero and player two here would again accept a one versus a zero now that we know that we can move one level up and ask what player one would do as for example this decision node well for choosing fair player one would get a four uh, because player two would choose accept here for choosing greedy player one would get a seven because player two would choose accept here so player one would choose greedy and similarly here player one would choose greedy for the same reason so now we know what player one would do at this level we can move one level up and ask what would player two do at this decision node and player two would have a choice of choosing to reject uh, player one's greedy offer so player two could choose reject but then player one would uh, give a greedy offer again and then player two would accept that and get one so in fact uh, for player two at this node Choosing to accept and getting one uh, would really lead to the same outcome as choosing to reject and still getting one. So in fact, player two is indifferent between accepting or rejecting at this decision node. We'll say player two accepts, but we could also say player two rejects. Uh, player two is really indifferent between those two at this decision node. Um, and then at this decision node, player two could accept the fair offer and uh, get a five or reject it and then player one would give a greedy offer and player two would accept that and get a one so accepting here uh, is certainly better for player two and finally we can move up to uh, the root of the tree and ask what player one would do for offering a fair split player one would get five for offering a greedy split player one would get um, nine of course if player two were to reject that player one would get seven Either way, it makes more sense for player one to choose greedy and get the nine or the seven than to choose fair and get the five. So um, in this game, 
the subgame perfect equilibrium would be this. Player one chooses greedy, greedy, greedy. Those are the three decision nodes of player one. Player two chooses accept here, accept here, accept, 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 accept. That's how we describe the strategy of player two because player two has six decision nodes. So um, that, in fact, would be the subgame perfect equilibrium. Um, now you might ask, are there any other Nash equilibria in this game? And in fact, um, there is at least one other Nash equilibrium, which is not subgame perfect, um, in which player two threatens to reject this fair offer, for example, and accept this greedy offer in round two, and accept uh, both the fair and the greedy offer in round two um, on this branch of the tree and then player one chooses to offer a fair split here and the greedy split here um, and um, player two chooses to reject a greedy uh, offer in the first round but chooses to accept a fair offer in the first round and player one chooses to give a greedy offer in the first round so um, in this with these pair of strategies player one gives a greedy offer, player 2 rejects it, player 1 gives another greedy offer, player 2 accepts it, and this is the payoff that would result from this pair of strategies. You should check that this is in fact a Nash equilibrium, so you should ask yourself, given what player 1 is doing at those three decision nodes, uh, could player 2 possibly do better? And given what player 2 is doing at those six, six decision nodes, could player 1 possibly do better? Um, and hopefully you would find that neither one could do better given what the other is doing and therefore this pair of strategies is an Ash equilibrium even though uh, it is not subgame perfect.